following is a video presentation of a morning worship service at Orville Baptist Church. Uh, so if you 
excited for that. We're looking forward to, to having a time of fellowship and uh, serving you. Um, I want to remind you for the rest of this week, we do have a few days off with the holiday coming up. Um, Wednesday, over in the Hayes building, we're going to take a break. We're currently going to the Sermon on the Mount. We are going to um, take Wednesday off. Um, so we will not meet in Hayes this, this Wednesday at 6.30. We will, we will pick back up the following Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday, of course, we're basically going to be on Thursday. And then just a holiday on Friday as well. We're going to have the office closed. So if you need something, call the cell phone. I will not have the office phone. And the secretary won't be there. So we won't be there. And then I also want to give um, some information about Tuesday. As many of you know, um, we do feed the, the hungry in our area every, every single Tuesday. Um, many people have asked about um, how to get involved with that. And um, some people are afraid to get involved with that. And I want to encourage you. Really, really want to encourage you to come um, if you're able to. I know there's a busy, busy week ahead. A lot going on. Uh, but come join us Tuesday. It doesn't matter even if you're a little late. There's some days I'm not even able to make it. There's some days where I don't have to come in. I get it. But even if you can come for just a little bit, come Tuesday. Um, there's probably going to be a big crowd We're doing a, a Thanksgiving type meal for our neighbors and the community. And um, it should be a really, really good time. And, uh, you have, if you're able to, uh, just really want to encourage you and invite you to join us. We, we meet in the Hayes building at 4 30. Um, you'll have so many opportunities. Just to meet, uh, to love, just to show care and compassion for many people in our area. Um, and also, you get to have a nice meal with them. So, I just want to encourage you to do that and be thinking about that and be praying about that. <laughs>
Ain't been looking at long enough to know there's no such setting as a short circle. <laughs> that one not got that ticket pretty good. As if that was an option. Uh, um, I feel like that I feel really the past two, three weeks, I kind of said this earlier, I've been a lot of heavy hearts right now. And um, I'm not all about feeding off the feelings and emotions. I feel like you just get to the truth of God's word and that's it from up here. And at the same time, I, I, sometimes you can just notice that it. it's just, it's kind of heavy and it's kind of in the air. And um, I feel like there's a lot of that happening right now with a lot of our people. And it's not a bad thing. And I think a lot of people get that feeling, that weight to it, and they say, well, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. No, 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 no. Um, far too many people define worship as high energy. You got to be doing all kinds of stuff to be extravagant to have worship. Those are not factors of worship. Worship is, is here. To me, there's a greater... Meaning there is a deeper meaning. To me, there is a greater even glory to be given to God. When in the midst of that heaviness and that heavy of hearts, you can still say you're good. So I don't have to sit here and get all energetic and, Church, are you with me? You don't have to do all that. But can you honestly say God is good this morning? God is so glorified when His people recognize his goodness in the midst of their tragedy and hurt. It takes so much more, and it's so much more difficult to say, God, you are everything I need when everything you got has been taken from you in this world. It gets more difficult, and people miss that so often. And so if you're here this morning and you have a heavy heart, well, you're joining together with people who are going to share that burden with you. But we don't put on makeup and wear masks and say, I'm hurting inside and yet, I'm not going to show it. Show it. Cry. We'll cry with you. Cry in here. Perfectly fine. God receives glory in, in grief. Because we're still able to go to him and say, You're so good. I just wanted to, I just wanted to, and it kind of even has something, it really wasn't planned. It has something to do with what we're going to talk about this morning. But this is our second sermon. From Acts 14, I divided it into three. I just did three. I can't do math. I divided it into three sections. And we're kind of labeling this a portrait of a disciple. I, don't, I mean, I don't have an official title for it, but uh, we're just trying to get very practical in Acts 14. We've seen so much of what's happening already. I want us to see the marks of someone who makes disciples, someone who follows Christ. And Paul and Barnabas, they arrive at Iconium, at the beginning of Acts 14, and just like clockwork, what happens? They're pushed out. They, they come in with the gospel. What do we say about the gospel last week? It divides. It really, truly does. It divides. You will lose friends. You might lose family. Jesus came with a sword. That's what he says. You might bring peace, but a sword. He divides naturally from people who hate God. Don't want anything to do with you. It's not because of your own flesh, it's because of Christ. They see Christ in you. This is what the gospel does to people. It divides people. The truth divides people. It divides the people of the city. In Acts 14, once again, you see the vision. And so they're driven out of the city. And what they do? They didn't give up. They didn't pack it up and say, let's just go home. They didn't call themselves failures and say, we failed and we can't keep doing this. And then we'll just stop preaching. It's the exact opposite. They went and preached everywhere. As they were driven out, they continued to preach, there is no such thing as a failure when you're being obedient to God. It doesn't exist. If you can honestly say, I'm being obedient to God's will for my life, it does not matter what happens to you, you are not a failure. If you were killed because of your faith, you didn't fail that life, you're obedient to the very end. Same thing with Paul and Barnabas. It was not about success or failure, it was about obedience. That was the whole point. And it started Acts 14 by going through this journey and, and noting the marks of the disciples. We had four, and I want to continue that this morning, looking at what makes a disciple, what makes a disciple maker. And so just to recap, we, we noted these four marks. And if you need a reminder, or if you're a note taker or whatever, I'll just briefly tell you those, those four marks in, in your own time if you're not with us last week. Go through verses 1 through 7, and you'll see 
these attributes, these marks of the disciple maker, they are intentionally strategic. They are intentionally strategic. Disciples are marked by patience. Disciples are boldly dependent. When we say that, we're talking boldly dependent on God's work. On God and His power, not on our own hands. And disciples are marked by obedience. I thought we could do an entire sermon in the last one. So that's what we said here for a while and talked about what it means to be obedient. So like I mentioned at the very beginning, it was not about success, it was not about failure, it was being obedient to God's will and God's plan and God's message. All going back to Acts 1, verse 8. Just go and preach to the world. Start here, then go here, and then go. And keep going. And you're seeing that journey unfold through Acts. All the way to Rome. It's a beautiful thing. All about being obedient to the Spirit's call and movement in them. God said go, what they do? They went. God said flee, what they do? They fled. God said preach, what they do? They preach. And speaking of which, of fleeing, they did leave at home. They eventually got news that they were going to be beaten, tortured, most likely killed. And they said, it's not our time yet. God's not finished with what we're supposed to be doing. And so they, they got out of our colony. They didn't leave because they were afraid. Instead, because they were not finished. And that's where we pick up today, starting in verse 8. And so let's begin there as usual. We will systematically go through all these verses, bit by bit, and continue to look and see what is it that makes a disciple of Christ. So the first two, or really first three, verses 8 through 10 of Acts 14. Let's read those together. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, laying from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. Our first point this morning, which would overall, in Acts 14, it would make our fifth point, but our first point this morning in Acts 14, the disciple makers use the gifts God gives them. Disciple makers use the gifts that God gives them. Paul and Barnabas, they make their way to Lystra after leaving Iconium. This area, this city, had become a Roman, a Roman colony. A lot of Roman influence. And like many cities, they had different backgrounds, all kinds of culture. Multicultural city. Especially now that it was a Roman colony. And so, right in this very instance, Right here, Paul and Barnabas are speaking to the natives. And when Paul is preaching, he notices a man who's crippled. He notices a man who is lame. And if you read verse 8 again, do you think Luke was trying to tell us something about this man? I mean, look at it again. He really, really wants you to know that he is lame. No strength in his feet. Lame from his mother's womb. Who had never walked? In other words, Luke is telling us he's never been able to walk. He's not going to walk, and he was born not walk. He's laying it on the fit, saying, he is crippled as crippled gets. He cannot get up. He cannot walk. He's not going to walk. It's never going to happen. And Paul's an opportunity to make use of the gifts that God has given him, equipped him in, apostolic power. So how did Paul see this? That's my big question. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. But read again in verse 9. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him, and had seen that he had faith to be made well. But what does that look like? I don't know. I, I, mean, I, have, I have thoughts. How, did, how on earth did Paul look at someone and realize just from looking at them that he had some kind of expression that said, I've got faith to be made well. I don't know. It doesn't tell us any, anything else. So I had, I had major, major questions. I want to know what. I want to know how. How did Paul see this? And yet at the exact same time, I think this is kind of natural. Honestly. I think it's a pretty natural thing. And we should read it that way. So, so super, super extra transparent time. I think this is why it was pretty natural for Paul to see what was going on with this man. Some people hide what's going on in their life, in their heart, in the moment. Some people put it on their face very clearly. Some people hide it really, really well. And you all know this. I'm not 
nothing, anything, anything new whatsoever. Sometimes it just shows up on the face. For the most part, most people give away what they're going through or how they're feeling or whatever it may be. They carry that emotion on their face. And you all know this. You see somebody, you can tell within half a second they have a good day or they have a bad day. You do this all the time with co you do this all the time with family, you might even ask somebody without even saying a word, hey, you doing it? Just because it shows up and you can see it. And we tend to express exactly what's going on in our hearts right here on our faces. And I think a setting like this, where I'm standing by the pulpit and there's so many people in front of me, I wish you could see my vantage point. I wish you could see what I see sometimes. And if you spend enough time up here talking to groups, you, you'll start pointing out things and you'll start seeing things. So I say this with Jess. Some of you give away things much easier than others when I'm standing up here. I see face after face after face after face. Sometimes it's even funny. I have gotten some in, inner laughs up here before. Don't fall on things in the preacher. Just watch this the whole time while he preaches. It's not the point this morning at all, but you can see some things that are easily noticeable. When you're preaching, you see it all. Uh, you don't have to stare and study. You don't have to stick on one person over and over again to figure out what's going on with them. But you can tell who's having a good morning. You can tell who's having a bit of a rough morning. Uh, you can see some people grin. When they're hearing something from the Word, they may grin and go, yeah. They give that little nod and say, yeah, brother, preach it. And it's just a, you, they don't have to say it. But I can see it. They're going, absolutely. Some people nod for all the wrong reasons. They nod like this. <laughs> it's a different kind of nod. <laughs> but it's, it's a much quicker nod. <laughs> Sometimes the jaws open a little bit. But you can kind of figure they have to have Thanksgiving early, turkey, meal, sleep. That Sometimes that happens. And you see these things. And so I'll tell you two expressions that stand out. And they're, they're not rare. They don't happen every single second. I'll tell you two expressions that happen when I'm standing up here that I absolutely love to see. I absolutely love to see. There is one expression that's kind of similar to you know, the grin and the, hey, brother, preach it. Let you know they're kind of like, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's great. That's a, that's a nice that's a really, really nice expression, and it kind of gives you some, some motivation. I'm being funny with all the other expressions and all that kind of stuff. But from time to time, you see this expression that resembles pain. And it's not like you know, holding the chest, holding the leg, holding their arm pain. You don't have to say anything. They don't have to say anything to me. You don't have to say a word to me or to anyone else. It's just called conviction. And you can see it. It's a lovely expression. It means there's some kind of truth penetrating someone. It's hurting a little bit. You go, whew. And you all know this face. Sometimes we even try to hide it. But sometimes when we're going into something incredibly either personal or deep, you'll see faces go, and you just know it hurts a little bit. It's a beautiful expression. There's another one that I absolutely love to see. And I mean, it's my favorite expression of all. Don't do it to be fake. Now that I'm about to tell you what it is. Don't do it just to, just to make you feel better or anything. There's some expression that I absolutely love to see. It is not a simple, happy grin. Um, it's not some kind of like little cheeky grin. It's just this expression of joy that I have really no other way of saying and explaining what it is. But you know what we see. It's just this unending hope. And the beautiful part is I have never seen it unless I'm talking about Christ. I never see that facial expression when I'm talking about an illustration or giving a story or giving some little point. I always see it when I'm talking about Christ and the cross. And for some people, it's conviction, because they know their heart. There's others who are saved, and they hear about the cross, and they hear about Christ, and you just see almost, sometimes even hands will go like this. And that, that kind of mouth will do this. You see the eyes kind of go down a little bit. And it's not because they're in pain, it's because they just have this burning hope. When they hear the gospel of Christ, it just fills them with some kind of joy. We're not... Stand up and shout, happy, clappy, congregation. We're not that people. But there's probably, from time to time, I'll, I'll even see this. Talking about Christ, I'll see the hands start to kind of do like that. From some of you. It's okay if you don't. But it's just you can see the hands almost want to go up and just say, yes. That's what God's Word does. And so, you see why I say it's kind of natural, I think, that Paul could have picked this out of this man? 
I don't know what it looked like. I can't even try to give you the face with my own, even though I have a pretty animated face. I don't know what it was like. But all I know is this. Paul looked at someone and he saw faith in that man. Paul looked at this crippled, lame man and saw faith. It didn't have to be some kind of overabundant amount of faith. It could have been mustard seed, quote, faith. All I know is this. When he saw that man, he saw unending hope. He saw joy. It had to have been a very special moment for Paul. The man is responding to Paul's preaching of Christ. And Paul is using his gift of preaching, his gift of encouragement, his gift of exhorting. In this sermon, in this message, the man has this rushing of faith flowing through him, this rushing of faith in God and God's power, faith that brings both spiritual and physical healing. And in the Gospels, especially here in Acts, this is how God shows his power. What we just read. This is how God sets his disciples and his apostles apart. Sets them apart and says, listen to them. They are my authority. I give authority to them. Listen to their message. Pay attention. World. Crowds. He put signs and wonders. Get to them with incredible works. And it wasn't to make them feel good. It was to show the world, listen to my messengers. Listen to my disciples. Listen to my apostles. They speak for me. And in the midst of this preaching, Paul sees all this happening. He sees an opportunity to put God on the spot. He sees a, an opening right before their very eyes. And he does it. A very simple command, much like Jesus said during that healing. Much like Peter said. And remember at the very beginning of Acts, the man at the gate? Get up. And what happens? He got up. Very, very similar. What does Paul say? Stand upright on your feet. Side note, the text does not say the man argued, oh, well, I can't, I've never been able to walk. You don't understand, Paul. I've never been, I was born this way, I, I can't get up and walk. There's no mention of any of that, no fussing, no fighting, no arguing. He stands up. It speaks to the man's study that he would listen. Stand up on your feet. The man has never done it before, stands up, pops up. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Paul's a preacher, he's a good preacher. He's a great preacher, very eloquent. Brilliant mind. Paul was in his educated to the fullest degree. Sees Christ through all, all of the Old Testament. And in the very middle of doing what he does best, he stops. In the middle of the delivering the message of Christ, he just stops. And what does he stop to do? Use his gift. Use the way he's been equipped by God. We walked through a study on the spiritual gifts on Wednesdays a little while back. A very good study. I think one of the great tragedies of the church, the modern church, one of the very great tragedies of the modern church, we don't think very much about our gifts. We don't, think, we, don't, we don't put much thought into how we've been gifted by God. I rarely heard about spiritual gifts growing up in the first two minutes. Didn't, didn't think about them, didn't, didn't hear much about them, certainly didn't put them into action. It was kind of rare to even hear about spiritual gifts growing up in the modern church. And yet, based on the text, every single believer is gifted in some form, very differently gifted. But all believers are gifted to be used for God's glory. And how strange is it? How, I mean, how incredibly strange is it? And honestly, sad that most Christians have no desire to be used, have no desire to even think twice about their gifts. Many Christians don't even <laughs> make mention or know how God has gifted them. Never thought about it. And yet He has gifted us. And we never use them. If there's anything you go home today thinking about, I hope it's not by itself. If there's anything you go home thinking about, I want you to be thinking about your gifts. How has God gifted you? Might be one gift, might be 30. I don't know. But in some form or fashion, you've been gifted to be used by God. He's gifted you, and I say specifically, you, sitting, listening, each and every one of you, have been specifically gifted with a specific gift. There's some way in which you've been equipped by the Spirit to be used for ministry, for God's glory. So you are gifted to evangelize, to advance the kingdom. Some of you have been gifted to make quick. I mean, 
doing fast, going from person to person to person to person, preaching the good news. Seeing disciples being added to the assembly. Doesn't mean anybody else is off the hook for never sharing your faith, by the way. It just means that some are gifted in this evangelism. Some of you are gifted to teach the doctrines of God. Some of you have been gifted. You might not even consider yourself a very good speaker. I already know myself. I'm a terrible speaker. And yet he somehow uses me. You've been gifted to teach the doctrines of God. The list goes on and on and on. So there's a big question this morning. Are you using gifts? Ask your, I mean, seriously, ask yourself that question. Am I using the gifts that God has given to me? Am I using them? Not because you're bored, but because you're on the prowl. And I, when I say on the prowl, I mean you are on the prowl, looking, searching around every corner for how you can use your gifts to glorify God. I think it's a much different thing. We talked about being intentional last week, did we not? Intentionally strategic. It's much different to say, you know, maybe I'll be able to use my gift in a way that I can kind of find. When's the last time you saw out and said, I'm going to use my gift today? Not if it happens to happen, if it happens to pop up, that I'm going to use the way God has given me. Very, very big difference in the two. I hope I can use my gift today. Say no to that. Say I'm going to use my gift today. I will use my gift today to bring glory to God. So that's our first mark of the disciple making. Looking, searching, using the gifts of God. Let's go to verse 11 through 13. When the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying the Lycanian language. The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. And wanted to offer sacrifice to the crowds. Second attribute of, the, of a disciple maker this morning. Disciple makers stand out. Disciple makers stand out. You were never meant to be the status quo. No. Paul, not Barnabas, not me, not you. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount right now. I mentioned on Wednesdays. And then very early on, Jesus tells the disciples, You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are not meant to be. You're not meant to be in the shadows. You're meant to be a beacon taking the gospel into the very darkest of the dark places. You're to be the salt and the rub into the wounds, so to speak, of the earth. You're to be in there. And believe me, you are to be seen. Not for your own glory, not to make yourself feel good, but see that people would see Christ in you. And the crowds here, they see some incredible miracle happen. This man is told, who has never walked before, get up, and what does he do? He stands up. They see this incredible miracle happen, and they see something they've never seen before. And they do something very unique and very odd, to be honest. In this part of the world, and what's incredible is we have actual, I mean, seriously, we have archaeological evidence. We have scrolls, we have pottery, we have all kinds of things pointing to this, verifying once again the truth of the scriptures, as if we need it. We have, we have true evidence showing all this to be true. In this part of the world, in this city specifically, in this city specifically, there was a large influence of Greek mythology. There truly was. There's, there's even pots and, and pieces of pottery given as gifts to the priest of Zeus that lived in Lystra. So the all mythological figures, the myths, the fairy tales of the Greek gods, worship them, all that kind of stuff. That all existed here in this area. And you might be thinking, why would they assume that these gods came down the form of Paul and Barnabas? Why would they attribute these men, Paul and Barnabas, to being some kind of Greek god? But again, I find this it's absolutely fascinating. We have actual scrolls from this time period showing this stuff to be true. There was a myth that happened, and a fable, so to speak, that, that went on in this area. And what happened is, according to the fable, according to the story, the tradition, whatever you want to call it, there were um, two travelers, two beggars that came into Lystra. And there were two elderly people living in Lystra. One of them happened to be named Philemon, crazy enough. And the story goes that, that beggars came through Lystra, no one would show care and compassion. No one would give them any food, no one would give them any help. Except for these two elderly figures, one of which was named Philemon. So they took them in, they fed them, they gave them clothing, they took them, you know, blah, 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 all in all, so forth. 
The next day, it was revealed the two beggars that came through were disguised. It was Zeus and it was Hermes, taking on the form of beggars. And so what they did to the townspeople, they struck them all down, except for the two elderly people who cared for them. And it was Zeus and Hermes checking to see if humans were compassionate or not. And of course, they are not. They're very rude and hateful. It's just a made-up story. It's a made-up myth. And yet people carry on this tradition. And so you can kind of see why they call Zeus and Hermes, can't you? They call Barnabas Zeus. They call Paul Hermes. Hermes in Greek mythology was a messenger. And so Paul was doing this, talking, 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 talking. They said, well, that's definitely Hermes, because he can't be quiet. So they thought these were gods coming down in the flesh. They actually thought Greek gods had taken on the form of Paul and Barnabas and come to them. They truly believed Greek gods had come down to them. Oh my goodness, here they are again. Take care of them or else they'll strike us all dead. They're really truly here. The point being with all of this, they were blown away, blown away by what God was doing. They were just blown They had no explanation for it. So the only way this could ever exist is if Paul and Barnabas here are actually Zeus and Hermes in disguise. And before you get some kind of big head and you think the one is supposed to consider you some kind of Greek God, let me get to the point truly. Here's our point. Our work should stand out so much that whether the world responds positively or negatively, they will remember there's no explanation of the God here. That's the point. We've seen this so many times even in Acts. Things happen. God does these incredible works and the people of the city cannot explain it. So they say ridiculous stuff just like this. They have no explanation of them to say it must be Zeus, it must be Hermes. There's no other way this could have happened. Your work should resemble this. And I'm not saying that you're going to raise lame people or perform the same kind of miracles. Those gifts are not available to us. But you've been gifted to be used by God so the world takes notice and says, that's not just them, there's something else to them. There's something else to that person. It's more than just flesh and blood and bone. It's more than just something they've been doing nice. There's something going on with them. The world needs to see that in us. We're meant to stand out as a light, as a beacon of hope. Paul and Barnabas stood out in an incredible way to the point they said these just must be gods. The point is not that everyone's going to bow down to us. In fact, in 2017, most people are going to hate you. Are you uplifted this morning here and there? Most people don't want to hear that in, in today's age. Most people are going to hate you for what you do. But guess what? You're still standing out. And the reason they hate you is because they see Christ. They'll make them all other kinds of things and why they hate you, but none of it's true. It all comes down to hating God. You're meant to stand out as a disciple of Christ so that people would see your good works and glorify the Father. And they would also see in your weakness God's strength. That's really the whole point. We should stand out to the extent they see this is not, there's no way I can do this. You can do this. It must be God. God must be involved. You're not meant to fade into the shadows. You're not meant to be someone who fades into the shadows and never interacts with the world. Quite the opposite. You're Told to go, shine a spotlight, be the candle, be a beam, telling the gospel. Expose evil, put the gospel on display. Leave people with no other explanation than to say, wow, something's different with this person. Let's finish up verses 14 and 18, or through 18. It'll be very quick. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing such things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own way, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. Our last point for today, not disciple makers are marked by humility. 
In case you are tempted to hear all this this morning and think, well, maybe I should be honored as a great God, consider this. Your life, your life, your existence, all of your incredible works, all the wonderful things that God is doing through you, it is meant to be walked with humility. Your life is meant to be walked with humble knees, walking in humility. And humility for many people means this, well, I'm just a sorry sack of nothing and I should never feel good about myself. That's not humility. That's called self-hatred. Humility is not just saying, I'm going to belittle myself all day long and think I'm just the scum of the earth. That's not what humility is. I want to tell you what humility is based on one of, one of my favorite preachers, what he kind of calls it. He says it's a position and a mindset. Humility is a position, an understanding of a position. It says this, God, you are God alone, and I am not. He goes on to say, it's going to God and saying, everything good from you, everything that is good is from you, and everything that is bad is from you. It's just looking at God in a position of saying everything is good in the world, God, it comes from you. It's not just saying I just want to die every single day and I hate myself. That's not what humility is. Humility is going to God and saying, you are so good. And everything that happens to me, and everything that happens to the world, and all the grace that comes, and all the good things in the world, all the many blessings you provide, they're all yours. I love that, God. I love that turn. Or to take part in it, you give it to us. Recognizing your position before God is humility. That's what humility is. And Paul preached humility. He says, we are of the same nature as you. In other words, we're just men. We're not gods. We're not Zeus. We're not Hermes. There's nothing special about us. We're just, we're just guys. We're the same exact nature as you are. Look at verses 16 and 17 once more. And the generations gone by and permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness. And that he did good and gave you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and with gladness. He uses this event to talk about, as a platform to talk about God's goodness. These people were not introduced to the Old Testament. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't go through all the history of Israel and see Christ in all of them. They didn't have any of this. He went to them and said, you see, open your eyes and look around you. Rain comes and gives you cool seasons. Rain comes and gives you a harvest. Fruit comes and gives you food. Look at all the ways God has blessed you. He uses nature to point to God, to these people. Look at all the things He's given to you. They all come from God. Paul will use the same means throughout the rest of Acts. To show people there must be a creator if there is a creation. But he says all this, and he couldn't accept it all the praise. He and Barnabas tried to put a stop to it. They, they didn't want to be glorified. They wanted God to be glorified. That's humility. How easy is it for us in our ministry, thinking we're some hot shot, doing good things for the Lord? People say, oh, you're such a good person. You just, it just fills and fills and fills and fills and fills. It is so tempting for us. To think so highly of ourselves that all the glory and all the attributes of goodness, they go on our own name. We should be people who are reminded constantly. Remember bold and dependent? We're constantly saying, it is God, not me. Trying to give me glory to the, no, 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 it's not about me, it's all about Him. Everything that happens is all about Him. The greatest example of this is found in Philippians 2. You have to turn there, we're going to wrap up. At this point, verse 3, starting in verse 3, Philippians 2, one of my, one of my favorite, again, portions of the scripture. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as something that's more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. You want the example of humility? Look no further than the cross. You want to see ultimate humility? Look no further than Christ. It is the ultimate, I mean, ultimate portrait of a humble servant. I preached on Philippians 2, I think on an evening sermon a while back. One of my favorite portions of Scripture. A lot of translations say some weird things, um, especially in verse 6. I don't know what yours may say. I'll read you mine once more. 
Mine says, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. The Greek used there for grasp means to pickpocket. Many people use this as a weird text to say, well, you see, Jesus was saying he wasn't God. No, that's not at all. The Greek language that we translate grasp means pickpocket. It's like a thieving term. What's being said here in Philippians 2 is that have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to use at his advantage, is what's being said here. He did not see his equality with God a thing for him to rob God of glory. That's what Philippians 2 is saying. Jesus, although existed in the form of God, did not use his status as a way to bring glory and honor to himself. He did not want to rob God the Father of glory. Can you imagine being God in the flesh, seeing the world what it is, and saying, no, it's all about God the Father. He could have ended us in a snap, and he did not. Christ could have burst onto the scene and eradicated every single person that ever existed, and he would be completely justified in doing so. And yet he did not. How did he come to us? You want to see humility? Look no further than Christ. God Himself in the flesh coming to us and being made into nothing. To the extent that we go to a cross, having His hands and feet pierced, stripped, beaten, tortured, spit on, crown of thorns put into His forehead. God in the flesh having His flesh stripped off of His body. Why don't he do it? To reconcile you to the Father. Because the Father deserves all the glory in the world and more. These are the attributes of someone who follows Christ. It will imitate Christ. Can we say these three things about our lives as well? And when we need that motivation, when we need to understand what it means to follow Christ, well, who do we go to? Well, Christ, of course. He is our example. He's our king. He's our Messiah. He's our everything. If you aren't sure, if you know this king, I'd like to introduce you to him. Everything you talk to me. Everything you talk to someone. I heard you talk to someone. It doesn't happen to me. Find someone. This morning, if you need to know Jesus because you currently do not know him, know him. Plead and I beg for you to know, repent and believe. Admit, finally, maybe even for the first time, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm not proud, I'm lowering it now to finally admit that I am. And I need salvation, I need a Savior. It's only, 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 the world will tell you otherwise, it is not true. There's only one path to salvation, and it's found in Christ alone, nowhere else. You need to meet this king. I encourage you to come talk with me. I'll be down in front if you'd like to talk or any other time. But find someone.